welcome to another edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Adrian Atkinson. It's the first Sunday of 2018 and we have an interesting show lined up just for you. Between the pages today, we have your favorite Sunday staple, issues and answers. Then later, Education Minister Royal Reed presents his back to school message. So don't touch that remote. The magazine starts right now. <laughs> More life. More memories. More moments. Jamaica Moves is a call to action to prevent non-communicable diseases. Get active. Eat healthy. You can protect yourself from high blood pressure, obesity, asthma, certain cancer diseases, and more. Restorative justice is an approach that personalizes the crime by having the victims and the offenders mediate a resolution that is pleasing to both parties. To find out more, we revisit a discussion between the late Ian Boyne and the coordinator of the Restorative Justice Unit, Kalila White. Thanks for joining us for our Issues and Answers, I'm Ian Boyd. The government has a, has, a, has a menu of things which it engages in to deal with the matter of, of security and, and, and crime control. And, and one of those areas is restorative um, justice. It's an important plank in the work of the Ministry of Justice. And today we have the coordinator of the Restorative Justice Unit of the Ministry of Justice, uh, Kahila White, and she'll be telling us about the work that this unit is doing in communities all across uh, Jamaica. A very vital work of helping people to resolve uh, disputes and to come to amicable uh, solutions. We thank you for your company. Good to have you, Mrs. White, thank on you so the much, program. Tell us the essence of the, the restorative justice program uh, of the Ministry of Justice. Okay, restorative justice can be thought of as one of the arms of alternative dispute resolutions. Uh -huh. It's another way of thinking about crime where individuals are most interested in solving their conflicts in a successful manner, run by facilitators at centers throughout the island. We have 10 centers throughout uh, the island. Outside of the court system. Outside it's of the court system. It's a means of dealing with, with outside of the court system. We reduce case backlog. That's, that's one of the goals. That's very important. And then we really want to promote peace and have individuals change, uh -huh. This have a cultural paradigm shift with resolving conflict in a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So that's the essence. That's the essence of restorative justice. So are there are about what, 10 centers? There are. In we, communities like what do you? We have communities in um, August Town. August. We just opened our latest centers July um, 2017 Was of this West year Kingston? in West Kingston, West Kingston, Tivoli Gardens, and Denham Town. Mm -hmm. Restorative justice centers are our yes. latest two. Yes. So you work in a number of inner city communities? Definitely. That's where the needs are. We've gone um, in those communities. We're in the West, we're in Montego Bay Montego and Bay. Sav Lamar. We have communities, Tower Hill here in Kingston, oh, Trenchtown, oh, Spanish Town, Clarendon. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we're excited about the work that's so taken tell place. Tell us more about the, the, the system. How does it um, work? Uh, perhaps I'm in conflict with, okay. with, with someone. Um, I might be thinking of taking the person to court mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Uh, and then I decide to come and see you. Yes. And um, you would have mediators, you would have people to, right. to help help me work through my dispute? Right. Well, we call them facilitators. They're facilitators. And the biggest difference between um, restorative justice and, say, mediation is that yes. we are focused on repairing the community. So you'll find at our oh. conferences, community members can be involved in the process. We've done 82 conferences from January to July of this year throughout the islands. Conferences. What conferences. do you call a conference? Conferences what? are you and I are talking, and 
we you would have support, I would have a support, and then some other. So, so both of us were in dispute. We're in dispute. So I would have my su support. Support. You would have your support. So would I. And, and then we'd have community representatives as a means of balancing. Like what? Per so perhaps a JP. Perhaps a JP. It could be um, community leader, a pastor. Exactly. School administrator. So we have individuals that really want to serve Jamaica, really want okay. to promote peace. We're, it, we're having a rally and cry. Join us. Become a restorative justice facilitator. You can pick up a form to be a restorative justice facilitator or volunteer oh. either at the Ministry of Justice or at any of our centers island-wide or even online. I see. One can volunteer to be you a facilitator. You can volunteer to, and go through the training process okay. because it's a training process whereby you would go and hear from other individuals and be walked through the process of in, um, ensuring that the conference would run smoothly, how to deal with different types of individuals, mm -hmm. communication skills, diversity, conflict resolution, you would learn all of that. So. Do you undertake educational uh, campaigns or programs in, in, in terms of uh, speaking to community groups, speaking yes. to schools. Yes, definitely. And if you're interested in having us speak at your church oh. or community organization, call us at call. the ministry, 908-5527. You can call so us. So you're available. You come We're and available. Talk to church groups. And it's free. And it's free. We, I must underline that it's free. We want individuals to know that they Excellent. can have justice yeah. any time of the day that they'd like. Call us, give us some notice, and we will come and meet you where mm -hmm. your needs are. And you will also teach us about conflict management principles. Most definitely, most definitely. Conflict management techniques. And we've done this in corporate sectors. We've had conferences. If you're having disputes at your workplace, workplace? you can call you can us call and, and we'll do conferences. So, um, you know, we're excited about what's taking place in justice. We just opened up our first justice center in St. Anne. So we're really excited that's going to have restorative justice, child diversion, and we're going to offer other services that you would find at Ministry of Justice. You're going to be able to access information about human trafficking and legal aid. So we're really excited about what's going on. Yes. So a great deal is happening in terms of restorative uh, justice. Not only are there facilities for people to uh, manage actual um, disputes, but there's a lot of dissemination of information um, telling people what they can do to prevent disputes. Um, and many of these disputes end in, in, in debts. So the high crime rate is related to our inability to deal with disputes. The coordinator of the Restorative Justice Unit of the Ministry of Justice, Tequila White, is our guest on Issues and Answers. We take a break. Every time there's a strong breeze, we are full of a leaf. End of my nightmare. She can't chop them go over tree and get away with it. It's a bearing fruit tree. It's all right. Me and I'll go have it out in here today. Lord Jesus. Who? Who? So, stop. John, want here, man. But, John, look here. At least hear what she have to say first, no? Hear what she have to say. No, no, but don't bother the war situation, man. Listen, we can go down to the restorative justice center, you know, man, and sort this thing out. You don't want to set up yourself for jail. Come on, let's sort out this thing. Once and for all. Restore the peace, restore the love, restore the niceness. A restorative justice. Ah, ah. Respect each other. A program of the Ministry of Justice funded through CSJP. Welcome back. Kagila White is the coordinator of the Restorative Justice Unit of the Ministry of Justice, and we are talking about the Restorative Justice uh, Program. I is this program working in, in, in Jamaica uh, where uh, culturally we have not done well at conflict resolution? Uh, we are not a generally mm -hmm. consensus building um, uh, culture. What, what has been your experience in the communities? Mm -hmm. 
emphatically yes resoundingly yes it's working in jamaica um i can't tell people you how many receptive to you. people are not only receptive they've bought in um just this past year from january we've had 82 conferences yeah. island wide with 684 individuals that were a part of the process of coming to an agreement out of the 82 conferences we had 78 agreements come mm -hmm. out of this where individuals agreed that you know what we had a conflict we're going to resolve it here's what we both like to take from this people are willing to change if they're explained to that the process is free this can lessen the stress in your life and it's another way to reduce the huge backlog that we're having in the court in the system courts, yes. i look at communities like august town where there's such a decrease in the violence and and we're seeing more of camaraderie. We're seeing more peace. And I see our own center, restorative justice, continuing to help hold up the mantle of spreading this peace throughout the island. And people are hungry for that. People want change. People are screaming for justice, but they're doing more than that. They're coming in and calling and, and calling saying, in. we want to be a part of this emails. I have WhatsApp messages. Yes. I'm excited to people even- People are coming to you. People you, you are don't coming. Have to be trying to no, interest them. <laughs> people are coming to us and saying, come to our church, come to our office space. Mm -hmm. We're having a conflict. So I'm seeing a cultural shift in terms of how people are thinking about resolving their issues. Even children, when we go into the schools and we talk about, yes. I did a role play um, earlier today at Norm Manley High School. Mm -hmm. And the children want to learn how to resolve these issues in a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pick up the machete. <laughs> they don't That's have to true. pick up knife or bottle or threaten each other. They can listen to each other's stories and say, okay, I'm hearing how this impacted you. I'm I'm hearing how you felt. How can we move forward from this? What would you like me to do? And you have spouses who come in also? Yes, of course. We have spouses that come in. We have neighbors that come neighbors in and settle. In so it's it's been a wonderful experience to see and be a part of. Yes. And you're a licensed uh, family <laughs> and married therapist? Yes, I am. So you, you have experience yes. in, in, in resolving um, yes. conflicts. And, and, and a lot of our disputes are mm. domestic. Yes. Um, disputes. Yes. That, that's a source of a, of a number of uh, um, yes. uh, murders. So we, mm -hmm. we do need help in that in, in that particular um, area. H how would you situate the importance of restorative justice and mm -hmm. the government's restorative justice program in the whole effort at containing crime and just building a more peaceful society? I think um, the great thing is we have a minister, Minister Delroy Chuck, and the permanent secretary, Mrs. Carol Palmer. They are committed to They're this They're committed program. to this program. I mean, the rallying cry is being heard. And what's happening is we've started taking up this baton to say, we will not sit down and see things happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of going into the schools, going into the churches, yes. getting our justices of the peace yes. to come on board with us, become facilitators, and help us teach each other how to manage these situations better. If you know, I can't handle it at home, let me go to some professionals that are trained to sit down, talk to individuals in a peaceful and a loving manner. And the heart of restorative justice is about grace and forgiveness, something most Jamaicans would be able to yes, identify with. Yes. So it that's, works. that's very much a part of our Christian culture. Of course. And Christian of course. Um, socialization. And in restorative justice, you also aim toward reconciliation yes. it's not just yes. a matter of um uh, dealing with the justice of the situation mm -hmm. but you, you you want you want to move into reconciliation improvement right. in the relationship most definitely and we see even at the end of our conferences we encourage individuals to break bread with one another so we actually have refreshments set up yes. for conference participants whereby they can actually the person that offended them you see these individuals loving each other yes. and talking with one another and really trying to hear and now understand because they've become like sister and brethren yes. they've become a part of the process of healing but but uh, mrs white you, you you also ensure that those who have done harm acknowledge that harm they must acknowledge and, that's and, the and don't key. make light of, of, no. of the harm but you know to 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 confess and to and to acknowledge the hurt that has been done 
Of course, that's one of the first things. In the pre-meetings, they have to acknowledge, I'm taking accountability. I yes. am the offender. Yes. This is what I've done. Hear my story. And then when they get into the conference with the victim, for the victim to then hear, right. this is where the person was coming from. Uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that they've been wronged. What it does is add clarity to that moment yes. in which they were wrong. And now we can move forward and come up with a plan to heal, forgive, and love and grace. Interesting. Kahila White is the coordinator of the Restorative uh, Justice Unit of the Ministry of Justice. The government is doing a number of uh, things. Yes, there's the zones of special operations. That's only one of the initiatives of government. This work of restorative justice is another uh, crucial aspect of the government's crime fighting, crime containment uh, plan. children and we have rights. We have a right to be protected, provided for, and included. Don't beat me up, don't belittle me, and please don't molest me. I am under 13. I should not be working for a living. That is child labor. It is illegal. Stop leaving me alone. I am too young to provide for myself. I need your guidance. Protect our nation's children. They have rights too. To learn more about children's rights, call or visit the offices of the Child Development Agency. With the new school year slated to start tomorrow, January 8, Education Minister Senator Will Reed takes a look back at the ministry's successes this past year and the plans to move forward with the continued development of our teachers and students. Good evening. As we begin this new school term, let me take this opportunity to extend Happy New Year greetings to all stakeholders in our education system, including our hardworking teachers, students, parents, board members, administrative and Siri, and Ministry of Education, Youth and Information staff. Each new year brings with it opportunities for renewal and a new focus, and this year will be no different. Whatever is achieved nationally will be dependent on what we do as individuals working together as teams in an extended chain of activities. Let us therefore go forward with a renewed sense of hope and belief in our collective abilities to find sustainable solutions to new and long-standing challenges in our education sector. We can look back at the year just ended with some satisfaction that much was achieved in advancing access to education by more of our students. We are pleased that with the allocation of more financial resources, our schools were better able to manage their administrative functions. There was also increased support for additional infrastructure development and the maintenance of selected primary schools. With more money being put in the system, the government now spends just over $37.6 billion on secondary education alone. This includes funds for salaries, grants, TVET, ICT, science, infrastructure, furniture, and nutrition. That means, depending on the school population that some institutions have, a higher per capita of over 119,000, while others saw 176,994 per capita at the secondary level. Through targeted intervention, teachers at the primary and secondary levels were helped in specialized workshops to better prepare themselves and their students for national exams. The results from the grade four literacy and numeracy tests were particularly encouraging and improvements were recorded in GSAT, CSEC, and CAPE. We must again say special thanks to our teachers for their dedication and professionalism in going beyond the call of duty in delivering a high quality product to our children. We're also pleased that we're able to develop the National Qualification Framework, and this was launched in February. In this way, we have begun to bridge the gap between academic qualifications and technical vocational qualifications. Our aim is to create a track for the occupational degrees 
that is separate from traditional degrees. We ended the year with the good news that more than 100 early childhood institutions had met all the operational standards of the Early Childhood Commission to be fully certified. We will continue the work to ensure that more of our basic schools achieve the set standards. In this new year, we will have the opportunity to consolidate and finalize policy positions to support improved performance in the system. The review of the education regulations is far advanced and when completed will address matters which have a direct or indirect impact on students' success. As we move ahead with plans to replace the GSAT with PEP next year, we have already started to roll out our examination preparation strategies with workshops and public education programs for teachers and parents. With our students in grade six now in the final preparation stages for GSAT, I implore all parents to give full support to your children. Encourage them, do not abuse them, even where you think they are not taking their work as seriously as they should. During the course of this term, we also intend to outline the proposed grooming and nutrition policy for schools. This is aimed at promoting a more healthy lifestyle among our students. In addition, as part of the wider government policy, we have made a commitment to place stronger emphasis on the development of Jamaica's early child education sector. To this end, we have provided increased funding in partnership with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security to reactivate the early stimulation program for mother and child from birth to age three. Our focus is to support the birth to three years old group through the early stimulation program, allowing our babies to be developmentally ready for the three plus years. Nutrition, stimulation, and protection from violence are three of the critical areas that should be addressed during the first 1,000 days, and we intend to step up the support in this area this year. We at the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information see our mandate as that of helping our students to develop their intellectual capacity and social skills to advance their personal and national development. We cannot do this without the full involvement of parents and teachers. The Ministry will continue to support professional development of teachers as part of our capacity building program. In this regard, the National College for Educational Leadership has trained over 2,000 school leaders in various programs who are making their impact in the system. We are now working with ENSEL to develop a certification program with multiple pathways, including prior learning assessment for those principals who may need this as a requirement to become fully qualified based on the criteria established for full appointment. This will provide greater flexibility for principals in the system. ENSEL is also embarking on policy-specific training on a yearly basis. Partnership is the key to achieving desired outcomes in the education sector, and we will continue to build on these relationships this year. I also take this opportunity to say special thanks to our friends and family in the diaspora who have supported many initiatives to partner with us in advancing the education of our children. Together, much more can be and will be achieved this year. As we move into this second term of the academic year, we are mindful of current negotiations underway between the government through the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service and the Jamaica Teachers Association. We value and respect our teachers and wish for an amicable and speedy settlement to these negotiations that is satisfactory to all parties. We advocate for mutual respect and wish to avoid any disruption to the education of our children the future of our country. Let us forge ahead, confident that much work has already been done to improve school plans, to support the nutritional needs of our children and the most vulnerable among them. We thank you all for your support and we look forward to a very good 2018. Thank you and may God richly bless us all. I wish for all Jamaicans a peaceful and prosperous new year.
You can never be too safe and a little reminder never hurts. This next feature highlights the do's and don'ts on how to be safe for the school year. CD um, primary responsibility is to ensure that children, the care and protection of children and children who are at risk, so that's our mandate. We know that some children have to traverse the roads going home, they walk. Um, we ask them to walk in pairs or in groups. We ask them not to play on the road, you know, because they get distracted. For the bigger ones, we ask them not to use their mobile devices on the road because you are not as alert as you should be when you are distracted. As best as possible, accompany the child or have somebody accompany them. If you have a taxi person or a bus that picks them up, make sure you know the persons who are taking the children, you know. Make sure you know the, the, the time they should get home. Have some way of being in contact with the drivers during the period to make sure that they are home when they are, should be home. So that if, if anything happens, you have a shorter window for action. What we want to say to teachers, know the students, know them, know you know their habits, know um, the general department and how they present themselves each day. So if there's a change in that, you know, a child who is very talkative, all of a sudden not talking, withdrawing, a child who is crying, um, of course there are the physical signs, you know, a child with a broken arm, there's a burn mark, you know, and you know if you use an iron to burn a child, you would see the mark, you know that kind of thing. So we, we ask them to be very observant. Um, we ask them, and I know um, the PTA is very critical, so you get to know your parents, you get to know your teachers, right? So we ask the teachers, as best as possible, to get to know the parents, so that if there is a change in behavior, even a slight shift, you can inquire as to what is the situation. Obviously, you could have the grades falling, for example, you know, a child who is in kindergarten starting to wet themselves again. And so if there is an issue, they have to do the regular reporting to the OCR. They can report directly to the CD as well. We have responsibility for wards of the state. And I really want to appeal to our teachers, our school community. We don't want them to treat the wards of the state as being different from any other child. They talk about being stigmatized, you know. Um, we talk about the children who are on path, you know. People really give you some horror stories about how they are treated. We want to encourage our school community, just treat them as any other child, right? Some of them have some special needs, you know, need probably a little more help. But we are asking that as best as possible look out for the children and our special needs children who are not like others in, in, in terms of physical sense probably, or even intellectually, we're asking that special provisions must be made for them within the school community. So we're already about to enter the second week in this new year and at this point most of us are brimming with excitement about the possibilities that may await us. But never forget, it's what we do with the new opportunities that will determine the impact on our lives. Join us again tomorrow right here on this same station for another exciting show. Don't forget to send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm. Stay informed on our social media pages, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, Twitter. You can also visit our website, jis.gov.jm, for more information. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.